Before we begin, let's have the staff for a roll call for attendance and establish whether we have a quorum. Parliamentarian Johnson? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I'll begin calling the roll with the chair. Chair Moore? Present. Vice Chair Brown? Present. Member Bradford? Here. Member Grills? Present. Member Holder? Here. Member Jones Sawyer? Here. Member Lewis? Present. Member Tamaki? Here. Member Montgomery Stepp? Here. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are nine members on the task force. There needs to be five members present for a quorum. There are nine members present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Now that a quorum has been established, the California Reparations Task Force meeting is now called into order. Welcome, thank you members of the task force and members of the public. Uh, happy Black History Month again. This is the second day um, of our Black History Month um, official hearing. And from a review of the agenda, you can see that it is a full agenda. So to ensure that we complete it during the time allocated, we will need to make sure that we follow the timeline established. Um, so Parliamentarian Johnson will also be assisting in that timekeeping as well. So without further ado, noting the time is 9.06 a.m., we'll now move to the next item on the agenda, which is a public comment period, and that will last for one hour exactly. So, Ms. Martin Walton and Ms. Hurtado, um, thank you. You can proceed. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Moore, task force members, and members of the public. My name is Aisha Martin Walton. I am with the Department of Justice, and the task force would like to hear your public comments. The public comment period will be for one hour, as Chair Moore has indicated, and each person will have three minutes. Please be advised that, in fairness to everyone, at the three minute mark, you may be politely interrupted and your microphone turned off. However, please know that there is a public comment period during each meeting and the task force encourages everyone to participate. You may also submit written comments to the task force at any time via email at reparationstaskforce at doj.ca.gov. To participate in public comment this morning, please use the raised hand function Locate the button on the top on the upper right hand side of the screen. On the sidebar, you will see the shape of a hand. Click on the hand to prompt the raised hand feature. On our end, we will accept your raised hand. Then you will see a notification at the top of your screen to continue. You will have to click continue. You will then be elevated into the meeting as a presenter and automatically muted until it is your turn to speak. Please note that there is a 20 second delay between the attendee and presenter mode, so keep that in mind as you're being promoted. We will accept the raise hand feature as they come in, and once the person in front of you is done speaking, Trini Hurtado, also with DLJ, will say your name to prompt you, indicating that you may begin. At that point, you will also have the option to turn on your camera. At the conclusion of your comments, or at the three minute mark, you will be muted and again and returned back to the level of attendee. So with that, good morning. Trini, let's have our first speaker. Good morning. Uh, our first speaker this morning is Josiah Williams. Josiah Williams, you've been <laughs> unmuted. You may now speak, you have three minutes. Uh, good morning, task force members. I appreciate being able to give uh, public comments today. Just trying to confirm, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, my name is Josiah Williams. I am a member of the American Redress Coalition of California, ARCC, and the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, CJEC. I'm also a member of the PAC Committee for the Oakland NAACP. 
Um, today, I'm here speaking as an individual and not a representative of any organization. Um, I wanted to start by addressing an issue that I see arising um, in the black uh, community, an issue of what I consider lineage phobia. Um, I define lineage phobia as the fear of a group that has a specific lineage. In this instance, one of those whose families descended from uh, shadow slavery. This phobia caused people to attempt to make black people a manala and intentionally or unintentionally deny them their specific reparations by the U.S. government. Um, it's a form of erasure. Those with lineage phobia mask are suffering and pain by saying we are all black the same and attempt to all lives matter or all black matter are specific justice claim. Dr. Weber made it very plain who the recipients of this reparations bill that she um, wrote must be for. Dr. Weber further stated that she would help various groups with their specific justice claims, but that this claim is a specific one. I come to you today as a representative of my community um, that no longer has a voice. I also come as a representative of the Williams family, not the Williams family in the South that owned plantations, but the Williams family in the South that were enslaved and built the foundation and wealth of this nation. I was there when we were brought to America on slave ships. Yes, I picked cotton, was beat, starved, and had a little rest. I was separated from my family. I endured Jim Crow, redlining, black codes, lynching, and a long list of atrocities. If you wonder how I endured those things, it's because the DNA of my ancestors currently run through my veins. If I didn't endure all of those atrocities, I wouldn't be speaking before you today. As the manifestation and representative of my ancestors and living family, so fight I. Reparations now for the descendants of shadow slavery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams. Our next commenter, please, Trini. Our next commenter is Shannon Wilson. Shannon Wilson, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes. Just a second. All right. Um, Hello, members of the task force. Um, I thank you all um, for your leadership on this historic vote. Um, and as you go into your vote today, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I would like to just say that specificity is key, um, as many other speakers have noted, um, when it comes to who is owed reparations in this country. There were direct harms done to a specific group of people in this country. And that is the American descendants of slaves. Us, we who remain to bear the brunt of our ancestors' frustration of justice continually being de delayed and denied. And it is we who are the descendants of slaves, the descendants of the survivors of the evils of Jim Crow, who should only be considered for reparations. Ms. Wilson? Trini, I think we just lost her. Yeah, I think we just lost her. I can still see her there, but. Are you able to hear me? Oh, yes, oh. we can. We can hear you. For every <clears throat> child torn away from their mother's arms, for every lynching, every dog and hose turned loose on us, for every mother's tears that fell and their son, when they, knowing their sons and daughters' lives were stolen all too soon by the evils of the hands of slave owners and regular angry white citizens, and for those of police and angry white mob, um, white, white mobs and massacres, and every bombing we had to endure, for everything that American descendants of slaves had to endure, I wanted back dollar for dollar with interest, and with that, being beneath the least that can be done. I want recompense, restitution, and reparations for all of that, that, which, that which happened. And the egregious human rights violations that were for hundreds of years on full display, I want it back for them. Wilson? Okay, I believe Ms. Wilson is done. Ms. Wilson, thank you so much for your comments this morning. Our next speaker, please. 
Our next speaker today is Joe Washington. Mr. Washington, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Mr. Washington? Okay, we will come back to you. Yes. Uh, the next speaker in line is Concerned Black American citizen, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Um, good morning um, and happy Freedman History Month. Um, Gug Squirrel Dud Dud Yak. My name is Dawn Page and I am an emancipated freed woman and a reparationist. I'm the founder of Concerned Black American Citizens, which is a nonpartisan political action organization that trains organizers and educates free, the, the freedmen community, uh, among other things. Um, I wanted to, um, after hearing um, the Dr. Weber and um, Dean Chimarinsky, I just wanted to amplify that based on the clear evidence presented by Chimarinsky and the crystal clear intent stated by Dr. Weber, it could only be deemed obstructionist and anti-American freedmen for any public official to pursue any policy based on race and that does not meet the um, criteria that would protect any kind of policies put forward from challenge, um, whether from uh, Prop 209 or um, any type of Supreme Court challenge. I wanted to um, impress upon um, the panel, which I'm sure you know how um, how illogical it is uh, for me, a descendant of chattel slavery, um, whose family has lived through uh, Jim Crow, um, redlining, mass incarceration, and the effects of that in the uh, child care system, um, to think that someone like a Winsome Sears, Lieutenant Governor from um, uh, Virginia, Jamaican immigrant who just arrived here in 1971 and in such a, uh, a position of political leverage to proclaim that we should get over slavery is unacceptable. And that type of rhetoric going forward, I hope, will begin to be um, given the, uh, the level of concern and pushback that it deserves. I want to warn against the uh, using American Freedmen's justice claim as a way to fix a broken system that attempted to break us and failed. The purpose of this claim is not to cure racism. It's not to fix our broken infrastructure or failed school system. I want to warn against using our claim as a community development slush fund. We will build our own communities, schools, and house and hospitals provide the capital for that. And with that, I'm going to end with the fact that I appreciate the work that's being done. I have a daughter and her husband who was born and his family has been in um, California for decade, decades and a host of other family members who live right in the city of LA. So I definitely have a uh, vested interest in the success of this. And I think um, Dean Chimarinsky and Ms. Dr. Page, Weber I'm have so made sorry it clear. To interrupt you, Ms. Thank Page. you. I'm done. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your comments this morning. All right. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Tiffany Quarles. Ms. Quarles, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Task Force. Thank you for taking my call. My name is Tiffany Quarles, and I'm a lifelong Californian a descendant of U.S. slavery and reparations activist with CJAC and NAASD. I'm calling to say that the vote taking place today regarding the community of eligibility must be strictly based on lineage. Throughout the duration of this task force process, you have had several ex expert witnesses, including the author of the bill, testify that lineage-based eligibility is the only way this can work. Please do not jeopardize justice for a people who have been oppressed for over 400 years and have been fighting for reparations for over 150 years because of your personal ideology and worldview. Making the community of eligibility race-based harms Black America as a whole, 
harms the federal push for reparations and even jeopardizes the global fight for reparations because we will not succeed if this is race based. We have a once in a life opportunity to get this done and get it done right. Many did not think we would even get this far. It would be a travesty and betrayal to throw everything away simply because some people may not be included. I'm asking that you do the right thing today and vote that the community of eligibility be exclusively descendants of US slavery and American segregation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Quarles, for your comments this morning. Our yeah, next speaker right. is Christopher Lodgson. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Today you have a chance to do something very, very special. You have a chance to decide that reparations are for the black people who actually built this country. The community of eligibility for reparations must be based on lineage, not race. This is the opinion and position of the author of the bill, Dr. Shirley Weber. It was her legislative intent clearly stated to you last month that lineage must be the criteria, very clearly. Your best legal advice yesterday from Dr. Professor Erwin Chemerinsky was that lineage must be the eligibility. The public comment and public will since this task force began back in June of 2021 has been overwhelmingly in favor, 95% plus in favor of lineage eligibility specificity. Here's what's gonna happen if you go against the legislative intent of the author. There will absolutely be political consequences, not just for the two sitting legislators on this task force, but for the governor during an election year. If you go against your best legal advice, you will risk reparations. If you go against the public will, you will create unintended, unimaginable backlash against any reparations you create. Do the right thing today. Don't delay this vote. Don't delay this decision. Be bold. Be strong. Make reparations eligibility about lineage only. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lachins, for your comments this morning. Trini, our next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Friday Jones. Friday Jones, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Friday Jones. Good morning. I'm Friday Jones. My name is Consa Jones Muhammad, and I am co-chair of the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants and a founding member of the Coalition for Just and Equitable California. Uh, today, I'm speaking as an individual. Uh, NAASD Los Angeles has been a leader in the reparation space. New Frontier Democratic Club, the oldest black dem club in the state, allowed us to present a reparations update where we presented lineage-based reparations as a priority, and we were very well received. Commissioner Mike Davis invited all of the African-American commissioners in Los Angeles to a meeting to present lineage-based reparations. There were questions about genealogy resources that we were able to answer, and the commissioners at large were excited about our work because many were from the South and are living survivors of Jim Crow law. We held general meetings and already engaged community about federal, state, and municipal reparations actions across the nation, and our perspective as descendants of the enslaved is well supported. The descendant community has been patient while this body took in information in order to process a vote who the beneficiary class would be. Defining the beneficiary class would be extremely helpful for public engagement because the ambiguity will be gone. Dr. Weber gave testimony about intent and that was clear. I wrote an open letter to former President Barack Obama on his position on reparations and how it has been a tool of white supremacists to argue against reparations. 
In that open letter, I talked about the slave trade in Libya where a man can be sold for $400, just $100 more than the sale of my great grandmother in 1779. Uh, Lineage-based reparations in the United States will be an electrifying around the world. The descendant community and freedmen have been seeking repair since eman emancipation. Lineage-based repair will help people still being enslaved today self-advocate like we have consistently done. It will be breathe life into CARICOM repair from the UK, France, and Spain. It is not the time to re-injure this community. We have asked the California uh, to consider a Department of Freedmen Affairs to continuously manage the affairs of the descendant and freedmen community. We've asked the state to disaggregate how it collects data on the descendants. We have asked for a uh, protected status similar to, to the indigenous who have treaties. This body has the ability to make those recommendations a reality. I ask you to remember our ancestors, making those heirs the beneficiaries of reparations with the foresight that it will matter in federal repair. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Jones. Our next speaker is Jonathan Burgess. Mr. Burgess, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Jonathan Burgess. Hello? Hello. Yes. Continue. Can everybody hear me? Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Task Force, members of the Task Force. Jonathan Burgess, you've heard me before, um, and I come here before you today as a foundational Californian. Family brought here in 1849, but born into slavery, descendant of chattel slavery. Uh, and doing my research, I know who my great-great-grandmother was. She was a free woman. Some of you know Nancy Ross or Nancy Gooch. My documentation says she was free, captured and brought into slavery. As Dr. Secretary Weber succinctly said, you know who was affected. And those people that were free were even captured and put into slavery like my great-great-grandmother. Mr. Williams that testified before me, I, I follow his sentiment because there was a Charles Williams who was listed as mulatto up in gold country, uh, maybe a free man, we may be related, don't even know. But again, the harm that we talk about as I listened yesterday happened to one particular group of people and those were the descendants of chattel slavery. And those people that were free, who we didn't know if they were black or not, were also captured and put in slavery. And so I would ask that this task force look at this strongly and do what Secretary Weber said. I'd also propose that you even consider, knowing what we know now, consider changing the name of this reparations proposal because it is race-based when we say it's African-American. This should be because I'm American and I'm a descendant of chattel slavery. On both sides, one was free. It is not California's job to do the job of the federal government. That's a bigger, larger claim, but it is California's job to set the groundwork so that everybody else will follow and get this right. As a founding descendant, of this great state, I would ask this task force, strongly consider the guidance that you've been given when it comes to making this based on lineage. I yield the mic, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Burgess. Trini, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ernest. Ernest, you've been unmuted, you now have three minutes. Can you guys hear me? You're a yeah. little low. A little low, okay. yeah. Hold on. How about now? Perfect. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yep. So greetings to Task Force members. My name is Ernest Russell, and I'm contacting you guys out of Michigan. I am a descendant of uh, slaves, or I am a descendant of those who were formerly enslaved who, who became to be known as freedmen. Um, I'm calling in today, just like I uh, have called in in other hearings to urge that you guys adhere to the language of uh, Shirley Weber's definition of the community of eligibility. I also want to urge that you guys, you know, support lineage-based reparations in your decision as it relates to the community of eligibility. The reason why I believe it is important is because I believe that in my blood, and just like the blood of many other people who have called in to this task force, is a unique history that is tied specifically to 
the American timeline and all of the injustices rendered upon black people. We have to understand that the group of black people that were in America were ultimately those who had their language, their, their culture, their heritage stripped of them. Those who were subjected to the three-fifth compromise, those who were subjected to the casual killing act, those who were subjected to the slavery laws from 1776 to 1865, and even those black codes that followed after that. As someone who can literally trace my family through that timeline in multiple states from Virginia to Alabama to, to uh, Georgia to Mississippi to Tennessee, you know, I believe it is important that we recognize that not all black ethnic groups share that history. And that if you guys were to open up reparations so that it was a race-based approach, you would be basically say, stating that you believe that my injustices, should, I, I mean, that the injustices rendered upon my family should somehow benefit groups of people who are just now getting to this country who don't know a lick spit about my history and yet alone my ancestral background. Like you would literally be saying that black Guatemalans who live in California <laughs> deserve the same justice as the black descendants of slaves who have been in that state for the last 200 years or so, or those those slaves, uh, the descendants of those slaves who have literally contributed to the timeline of California despite experiencing injustice after injustice. I don't believe that was the intention of uh, Shirley Weber. And I believe that, you know, the task force has within itself the power to forge, you know, uh, to forge forward under the name of lineage-based reparations, supporting the community that was harmed. And with that, you know, I'll uh, relinquish the mics. Thank you, Mr. Russell, for your comments this morning. Trini, our next speaker. Our next speaker is going to be uh, Joe Washington. We're gonna try again. Okay. Mr. Washington, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Okay, it sounds like we still can't hear him. Um, I'll continue working with him. Okay, the next speaker is Giles. Giles, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Thank you, for, thank you for giving me this time. We are gathered here to discuss the fate of a bill designed to correct this nation's original sin. What we're talking about is the Ma'afa, an international genocide that trafficked enslaved Africans from the Igbo, Yoruba, Ashanti, Wolof, Remenkimi, Bakongo, Swahili, and many other population groups on the continent. These weren't aliens, Martians, inanimate commodities, or non-existent aboriginal ghost populations. They were human beings. They were Africans. This bill must be committed to full repair for these black African descendants enslaved in the United States. To avoid the mistake of misdirecting set-asides to 501c4s, online retail stores, and other malevolent actors posing as reparationists, whose subversive goal is ethnocentric division, as opposed to full repair. Even though we understand that no amount of money on its own could heal the impact of centuries of genocide and that a one-time compensation would be appreciated, full repair means a commitment to long-term expenditures to achieve the policy objectives in the five injury areas as recommended by the International Law Commission requirements for reparations. Cessation is a guarantee of non-repetition non of institutional actions like the Jim Crow policies that impacted the descendants of enslaved Africans who crossed what is now the Mexico border and built Los Angeles. Restitution and repatriation offers resources for the descendants of freedmen expatriates on the African continent and modern American Africans who followed after men like Paul Cuffey and Henry McNeil Turner and chose to repatriate to Africa in order to restore their lost identity. It means following after the tradition of the new African independence movement along with Marcus Garvey and the UNIA ACL, in establishing pathways for black institutions here in the United States who desire to take part in the development of the African world, particularly the sixth diasporic branch of the African Union. If historical precedent is to be our guide, we know that international collaboration is a necessary component of full repair. Satisfaction and rehabilitation means resources for African language learning, 
knowledge programs and what our local theologian, California's very own Salim Faraji, has termed a Sankofa Reformation to return black churches, masjids, and spiritual institutions to their African roots. There are a wide variety of policy prescriptions that can be chosen to fully repair the black African descendants enslaved in the US. The integrity of this bill and its commitment to full repair must be maintained at all costs in order to accomplish these goals. With that, thank you for your time and I yield my mic. Thank you, Mr. Giles. All right, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Yvette. Yvette, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Yvette? Okay, I'm going to come back to her. Mm -hmm. The next speaker is Lillian S. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Hi, yes. I don't know if you all have talked about the requirements for the reparation yet. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, for the reparations yet, but I feel that um, it should be uh, based off of um, you should have a high school diploma or a GED equivalent. You should be put through a financial literacy course. You should go through seven sessions of therapy and you should be you should have uh, be handed a DNA test to, to take to make sure that, um, you know, uh, you know, your lineage and, you know, that you are a descendant of slavery, because um, whether or not, you know, generation, I mean, reparations are owed to us. It's not a question because, you know, America was found guilty on five accounts of genocide. Um, you know, obviously it is owed since we have built, you know, the economy in um, the, U the U.S as well as the U.S. have paid reparations for genocides that have not went on in this country and not and have not taken account of that same country's genocides that they have taken on other Black and African people, you know. So I feel that, you know, it's, it is time for us to get what we deserve because in, in with the economy here in America, not only have, you know, our foundations and communities have been built down, but they have been burnt down with no remorse. Black Wall Street, and as well as our communities that are under national parks and beaches. So, you know, whether or not we des we deserve reparations is not a question. It's just of when we will when we will get them. And I yield my mic at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Lillian, for your comments this morning. All right. Next commenter is Dr. Kimberly Ellis. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Okay. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Yesterday I testified about my work on the Tulsa reparations case, and I also have family in California. Uh, clear that reparations must be cash payments and systemic remedies. I uh, heard intently the experts that testified yesterday, and I heard Dean Irwin Chemerinsky talk about lineage-based and proxies for race. Um, I support that idea. How do we do that when it comes to proxies for race? Well, sometimes it could be done largely by zip codes, Jim Crow segregation housing by zip code, redlining by zip code, low income, uh, and unemployment uh, with current discrimination also by zip code. That's one way. I heard Deidre Farmer Pellman talk about direct traces of corporations and getting those records from many of the corporations that have been trying to hide um, their connections to slavery. Maxine Waters is actually working on that on behalf of Tulsa right now. So I definitely want to see a dual approach. Ajiwa Ayatoro talked about with a focus on international human rights as targeted by a people. It was clear to me that uh, Dean Timorinsky uh, and Kiti Taifa 
Deidre Farmer Pellman and Ajwa Ayatoro should be having a conversation. I don't think that a vote should be made without them having a conversation and mapping out a really important plan. Uh, Chimarinsky admitted that helping people trace their lineage, even though he supported the idea and he thinks this is the best um, way forward, that tracing lineage from slavery would be a tough task. So what are some of the other ways that we can do this? One, slave voyages records that Deirdre uh, Farmer Pellman mentioned, insurance companies, um, the 1870 census, the Freedmen's Bureau registrants, depositors into the Freedmen's Bank, the Civil War census records from 1860 onward, Union or Confederate or subsistence farmers who assisted on either side, lands granted by local governments to descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States, and including the Treaty of 1866. Yesterday, as I lis listened intently to the testimonials of every expert witness you had, I also had to re-listen to them this morning because of the extremely harmful distractions of the hate speech in the comments section. Attorney Deirdre Pellman Farmer was literally called a, quote, a despicable hoe. And the work of historic groups like Encobra were repeatedly insulted and dismissed, and the personal attacks against myself and others were rampant. This cannot continue, and please consider this as my formal complaint about the comment section. As I really recently found out, this is a consistent pattern. I support you all's work. Um, I honor you. I would love for this to be a success locally, statewide, federally, and internationally. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Ellis for your comments this morning. Our next speaker is Joe Washington. I think we've uh, solved his issue. Mr. Washington, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Fantastic. Good morning, distinguished task force members. Thank you for the opportunity to share some brief comments with you today. I commend the California State Legislature and this task force for undertaking the critical study of the institution of slavery and its lingering negative effects on living African Americans, including descendants of persons enslaved in the United States and on society, and to recommend appropriate remedies of compensation, rehabilitation, and restitution for African Americans. Putting this in the international context, it is important to recall the UN adopted in 2001 the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, the DDPA, which ambiguously stated that the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans was indeed a crime against humanity. The DDPA is the UN's blueprint to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance globally. I would like to also draw the task force members' attention to the UN document entitled Basic Principles and Guidelines on the Right to a Remedy and Reparation for Victims of Gross Violations of International Human Rights Law and Serious Violations of International Humanitarian Law. This document, adopted by the General Assembly in December 2005, states that among the areas that oppressed individuals and groups may demand redress include the right to a remedy, the right to an investigation, the right to prove truth, sensation and guarantees of non-repetition, restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, and satisfaction. The work of this task force is also timely if one recalls that in December 2014, the UN General Assembly proclaimed the International Decade for People of African Descent to run from 2015 to 2024. Thus, we have two critical years remaining. The decade encourages all countries to look at their past and take appropriate and effective measures to repair harms done to people of African descent throughout the African diaspora as a result of the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans. Here again, reparations is listed among the tools states should consider as redress. The above UN references may be useful in placing your important efforts in the international context and providing useful frameworks for analysis and action. I urge the task force to confront the complexity and multifaceted areas whereby African Americans in California have experienced a lifetime of violence, 
including direct structural and cultural violence. This has been manifested in all areas, including education, health, employment, housing, economic development, and the administration of justice. Mr. Washington, has, I am so yes. sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your sentence and thought. Thank you so much for your comments today, but your three minutes have expired. Thank you again. Thanks for sharing. Our next commenter is Marcus Champion. Mr. Champion, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good morning, my name is Marcus Champion. I'm a California native, born and raised in Inglewood, currently residing in South Central Los Angeles, a board member of CJEC and a founding member of NAASDLA. This morning, I want to demand that the task force not delay the vote again in determining the community of eligibility as it was pre previously delayed in July. As a young black boy growing up in the 90s, I was made to feel like I should seek to be anything else but my lineage. There was only superficial education of what my people suffered during slavery and Jim Crow, and there was a shame attached to being a descendant of US slavery. It was in the last 10 years of my awakening and reading books like Dr. Claude Anderson's Black Labor, White Wealth, the half has never been told, slavery by another name, and others did I truly understand the extent of the atrocities we have, we have suffered in this country. It was then I understood the perseverance, determination, iron will, unbreakability, and ultimately love it took for my people to not only survive the evil perpetrated on them in this country, but to simultaneously build the richest country in the history of the world. There's an unquestioned debt owed, and this task force has a responsibility to see it through to the specific descendants of US slavery who endured and carried on. As an NAASD and CJEC board member, I've been a part of this process since it was a resolution introduced by Dr. Weber before it was a bill. And after countless community meetings, information sessions, online workshops, podcasts, face-to-face -face conversations, it is clear that the people demand a lineage standard, not a race standard. Not because we don't have love for the diaspora, because there's an understanding that harm is specific, and law surrounding recompense for that harm is clear. Today, I demand that the task force adhere to the legal opinion of one of the foremost constitutional experts, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky, and adopt a lineage standard because as the Dean stated, a race standard is highly suspect and would ensure reparations will fail. I demand the task force respect the legislative intent of Secretary, Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, and adhere to the lineage standard that makes the eligible party African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States, as outlined in AB 3121. I trust you will be on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Champion. Rini? Okay, our next speaker is Maika Velasquez. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Maika? Me. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, this has to be done based on lineage. To, to echo what the previous speaker just said, it, this is a legal matter concerning a specific injury. This is reparations for slavery, redlining, um, and the other things born out of the racism of slavery are separate issues. When it comes to slavery, it is a specific injury put upon specific people. It's a legal question. I don't even understand how we're having to beg people to vote for this because it is something that has to be done. You cannot include all races. I myself have lineage starting in Louisiana, Haiti, and Puerto Rico. Yet I cannot make a claim based on the slavery of Puerto Rico and Haiti against America. Those claims belong to Spain and France and vice versa. A descendant of American slavery cannot make a claim against France, Spain, or any other European country. The fact that this is even a conversation is insulting. We ha would never do this to any other group of people. The Asian community in regards to say Japan and the reparations they received for World War II 
there was no major issue in deciding who would get that when it came to um, the Marshall Plan and rebuilding Europe after World War II. We were very specific about that. And if you look at some of the people that benefited from basically what was seen as Jewish reparations, some of them had even worked with the Nazis. We give reparations to Native Americans that participated with the Yankees in the genocide against Native Americans and actually owned slaves and participated against the genocide against black people. This is utterly ridiculous. It has to be based on lineage. That is not even a question. And for this to even be happening and to have to have people calling and saying, please, when you make your vote, make sure you vote on lineage. It's, it's a legal matter. You have to make sure it's based on lineage because it is a specific injury to a specific group of people. That, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Velasquez, for your um, comments this morning. The Trini, next, next commenter is Maurice Mohammed. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Mr. Mohammed. Unmute yourself, Mr. Muhammad. Okay. All right, here we go. Thank you. All right, thank you. Again, my name is Maurice Muhammad. I'm the National Director of the Black First Initiative. And I want to salute the um, task force for taking up this challenge on reparations. Reparations is part of the challenge of our time. This justice claim is so important. You are not only speaking for the living, but you're also speaking for the dead. You're speaking for the dead ancestors of ours that were enslaved here in America who couldn't speak for themselves, who couldn't take justice for themselves. So you are their living vindication. And we beg of you, we plead with you to make sure that this claim is lineage based. Because as we see throughout America, they're trying to cover up the crimes of slavery. They want to cover it up and make it so it's not even taught. So you are the hopes of our people. You're carrying them with you. So we ask you to make sure you don't silence them. Keep it lineage based. Give justice a real shot. This is something that is the challenge of our time as we walk into history boldly declaring that our relatives shall never be forgotten. And as Fanta has said to Kunta Kinte, they've taken everything from us. We can't even be us. We ask you, keep it lineage based. Give us our justice. And I thank you for listening. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Muhammad. Trini? Our next speaker is Robert Kalen Reed. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right, the grassroots activism done to enact AB 3121 was done by committed reparations activists who had a clear mission statement to advocate for reparations on behalf of the sons and daughters of freedmen, otherwise known as those who can trace their lineage to the wealth building apparatus of US slavery. Since it is the responsibility of this body to do the will of the people, I think the people's interest should be taken into consideration as inclusionary criteria is voted on today. Outside of a few subversive organizations, the tenor of inclusionary criteria lean towards lineage specificity. If anyone has a problem with that, with that I think it best to abdicate your position so that another member could be voted in as to maintain the integrity of the commission. When it comes to the Pan-African understanding of repertory justice, it is unjust for ADOS to be forced into a situation where the ethnic distinction is flattened, flattened and erased, their history hijacked, and their repair administered to everyone based on blackness or even historical injustices com committed in other parts of the world. ADOS do not want to impede anyone from doing the work to develop their justice claim. In fact, we welcome it, but they must do the work. 
A true Pan-African unity will be when American Negroes fight in their homeland, when Cuban Negroes fight in their homeland, when Trinidadian, Haitian, Nigerian, or Ghanaian Negroes fight in their respective homelands, because then you develop a system where the powers that be cannot use one group to sabotage the work of another by creating buffer classes that pits one side against the other. Reparations in America should be paid to the descendants of those who were affected by the harm. Furthermore, I want to take some time to clear the misunderstanding that reparations is just a check. This committee was convened not to not only consider a monetary payment, but a multifaceted set of agenda items that finally includes Black Americans into the fabric of America. Cash payments are but one aspect of this repair. A Black agenda is another. It is in the Black agenda that protections from current discrimination can be found. Lastly, reparations is not a tool to fix or cure racism. Reparations returns to AWS the wealth that was stolen and a full access to citizenship. So when their rights are tra transgressed upon, they have constitutional protections that are justly enforced to protect them. I ask the commission to not let bad faith actors deter you from righteousness. P.S. Note to H.R. 40, due to the mismanagement of NARC and Encobra, the bill does not exercise the will of the people, but instead creates cushy government jobs for organization members. It should also be considered an act of violence that Dr. Kimberly is trying to deactivate the chat because that gives her and her group unmitigated access to the commission while leaving other groups out. Transparency for the good, bad, and ugly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kalen. All right. Next, on speaker, next speaker is Natalie Champion. Natalie, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, good morning uh, to the task force and thank you for this opportunity to give public comment. My name is Natalie Champion and I am representing NAASDLA and I'm also a resident of Los Angeles, born and raised in Compton, California. My father's mother, Bashi Lanier, and his father, Joshua Simon, came from Cotton Plant, Arkansas to Los Angeles, California to find opportunities beyond the sharecropping and cotton picking path that their parents and grandparents had to endure. My mother, Addie Simon, left Natchez, Mississippi at the age of 14. Natchez, the place where black slaves who made their way to freedom were forced into concentration camps established by Union soldiers to essentially eradicate those slaves with over 20,000 freed slaves being killed in one year in this American concentration camp called the Devil's Punch Bowl. My mother, Addie, at 14, fled Natchez and the history of brutality and discrimination and came to Los Angeles to find opportunities and a better life. It is my parents and my grandparents and their parents' legacy and lineage that allow me to unapologetically center who I am as a Black American descendant of U.S. chattel slavery and as an advocate for my people to receive the justice claims owed for the worst human atrocity in human history, American chattel slavery, and the subsequent state-mandated discrimination and terrorism that my people have faced. I, along with so many grassroots activists, our parents, professionals, active within our community, trying to live and carve out a future that is worthy of the dreams of our parents, grandparents had for our future, their dreams that allowed them to keep facing another day of brutality, terrorism, imprisonment, slavery, and bondage. This task force exists because of that advocacy, because the community has spoken that our heritage, our lineage as Black Americans is worthy of redress, and we are demanding this task force to honor and center our unique and unparalleled contributions and experiences as Black Americans of U.S. chattel slavery and making sure we are repaired and made whole. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing, and I hope you honor this legacy and request. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Champion. Um, right, let's do a check-in, um, Trini, really quick for, for okay. Chair Moore. It's 9.58, and how many... Um, well, public comment is technically over at 10.06. How many speakers do we have in the queue? About 27. Wow. 
care more, care more um, task force. <laughs> Uh, maybe parliamentarian, would you like to hear from parliamentarian uh, Johnson, or shall we proceed to 1006? Well, see what the options are. Yes, we can proceed. Um, hmm. I'm looking at the schedule. <laughs> uh, Parliamentarian uh, Johnson is on also, should you need assistance? Well, we do have a schedule. Um, it's important, <laughs> uh, but but we really, I mean, you know, you've got a very impacted schedule, as you mentioned earlier, Madam Chair. So perhaps you can take a, you know, move, proceed, and then, uh, if you have time as you go through the schedule, maybe you can offer that opportunity up. But I, I think the the, the uh, task force, uh, you know, I don't know what their schedule is, but we, you know, the bottom line is that you, you've got. I'm looking at the uh, at your agenda, and given all that's on there, especially the discussion that you're going to have to engage in relative to the comments that you've just heard and what you heard yesterday so um i think the task force may want to weigh in on that as to whether or not you continue because if you take 20 times three and if the list continues to grow you're going to move in and through the rest of your you know your time that you schedule for the other agenda item madam chair yes vice chair brown you're right i think I feel that in order for us to maintain the integrity of this August body, we should stick to the agenda mm -hmm. and go ahead and demonstrate the courage to listen to what we've already heard from the people. We've heard an inclusive, universal sample. Now is the time for us to be on the right side of history and stand for what is right. So I would move that we would maintain the agenda and go ahead and deal with what we've set out to do on this decisive day. Okay, thank you for that, Vice Chair Brown. So we'll 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 have six, seven more minutes and and that'll be it. Mm -hmm. All right. So Trini, let's call the last two speakers. Okay, the next speaker is Matthew Morris. Mr. Morris, you've been unmuted. You may now, you now have three minutes to speak. Can everyone hear me? You're very um, low. Okay, can everyone hear me better now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so do we not count? Let me remind the ones that say reparations are unnecessary because slavery was quote unquote long ago, that it was not just the institution of slavery that is the issue, it was a systematic disregard and dismantling of the black community's wealth based on race. The crack epidemic, the assassination of our civil rights leaders, and the Jim Crow laws that allowed for atrocities such as the Rosewood Massacre in 1923, there has been clear evidence of a genocide that's taken place on American soil even after the institution of slavery was abolished. For those that may not know, the definition of genocide as defined by Oxford is a deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. When you look at the carnage that was done in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to what was referred to once as quote unquote Black Wall Street as the way to destroy the wealth of the black community, that was genocide, not even mentioning hundreds of years of slave labor that built this country. To put into perspective, it only took 46 years for Japanese Americans to be awarded reparations after internment camps. The Mexican War of 1846 that was started over slavery took only two years to end in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that was signed in 1848 by Nicholas Triss, who was representing the United States and was sent by President Polk. The very treaty that clearly granted reparations to the Mexican people. Do our lives as black people not count? Jim Crow laws clearly discriminate against us as black people, so why would there be any moral objection to the reparations paid to these peoples and their descendants? The precedent is already there. When will the federal government finally be the example of accountability that asks of its citizens? 
if any of us commit a crime, do we not owe our country a debt? So when, I ask, will our debt be paid? For us as Black people, we were not just robbed of tangible resources and intangible opportunities. We were also robbed of the peace of mind that our nation intended for every citizen when the very Pledge of Allegiance to America stated, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now is the time to truly stand by those words. Reparations is to repair the damage of these systems that was never done. You cannot repair things without accountability. Accountability means not just not being afraid of apologizing, and you cannot apologize if you are afraid to let your face be shown and let the world feel your remorse. Thank you so much for your time and listening. Thank you all for doing this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morris. All right, this will be our last speaker of the morning. Trini? Uh, the last speaker is Angela Nirvana. Ms. Nirvana, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Angela? Okay. Uh, the last speaker will be uh, Yvette. Yvette, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Okay, try this again. Lena Robinson. Lena Robinson, you'll be our last speaker. You've been unmuted, you now have three minutes. Thank you and good morning. Let me turn my camera on. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, thank you. Good morning, my name is Lena Robinson and I'm a native of San Francisco, California. I have benefited from the relative comfort and opportunities of being born in the 60s and in a place that allowed me access and rights that my ancestors never knew. Today, I advocate on their behalf. I am also a member of the Black Jewish Unity Coalition who share my views. Slavery, wage theft, segregation, Jim Crow, unrelenting oppression, whippings, lynchings, systematic prejudice, state-sanctioned mistreatment, police brutality, over-policing, racial profiling, white privilege, broken promises, stolen land, unemployment, poor schools, substandard housing, ghettos, redlining, disinvestment, predatory lending. These are the practices and policies that Blacks have endured for 400 years. For 400 years, without relief or remorse, these policies have held Blacks down, creating roadblocks to our progress or even our ability to keep pace with others. It is the cumulative effect of these policies and practices that demand reparations. Reparations should provide a tax-free cash payment to the living descendants of Black Americans who can trace their lineage back at least four generations to their enslaved ancestors. For me, that would be back to my great-great-grandparents who lived in Texas and Mississippi in the mid-19th century. Reparations alone cannot heal the deep wounds inflicted on Blacks for centuries, but they are the price that must be paid for the transgressions of this country. Reparations means creating a federal agency similar to the Bureau of Indian Affairs to manage a process for delivering these payments to eligible Blacks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Thank you all to all of the commenters. We have reached the allotted time for public comment this morning. If you were not able to provide public comment, we, are, we regret that. However, we invite that you attend future public meetings or to submit written comments or testimony via email at reparationstaskforce at doj.ca.gov. I will now turn the meeting back over to Chair Moore and thank you, Trini, for your assistance this morning. Thank you, Ms. Martin Walton, and thank you, Ms. Hurtado, for facilitating public comment, and thank you to everyone who made public comment. Uh, apologies for folks who weren't able to make their um, voices heard through public comment, but you can obviously email us and contribute your contributions to the chat.
Uh, so the next item on the agenda is um, act, uh, number 14, potential action item, discussion on community of eligibility, task force members discuss amongst themselves and take a vote that will provide direction to experts on, on the scope of work. So this item on the agenda should last up until 11 a.m. That's the time that we have earmarked for it. And then after um, this item, we have item agenda item number 15, potential action item, expert consultant for second report, which will last from 11 a.m. to noon. And that's where um, advisory committee members, Jovan Scott Lewis and myself, along with the DOJ Research Center, um, discuss members of the expert consultant team, um, including time for these experts to introduce themselves and any issues that need to be discussed relating to the scope of work. And we could potentially also take a vote on the members of the expert team. And then after that is lunch. I just wanted to provide some full context um, that may be helpful in guiding our discussion for agenda item number 14. So returning back to agenda item number 14, potential action item, discussion on community of eligibility. Um, I would like to now take the time to recognize any task force members who has any contributions, comments, reflections, or questions um, based on the ongoing conversations that we've had about this topic for some months now. Um, and again, I wanna provide an open space where you know, task force members can be transparent about where we all lie on this very important topic. And again, we have an hour for this, right? So it's it's not nothing that we have to necessarily rush. Um, and so now we'd just like to open the floor if any task force member would like to be recognized to start us off with this discussion. Oh, sorry, Javon. Uh, Member Scott Lewis, you recognize me. Yes, hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. So, you know, this is this is a conversation that I'm that I'm I'm glad that we're finally having. Um, and you know, I, I think it's one that I think we all know, in fact, that it's the center of of our work. Um, and so it's it's necessary that we come to a very clear uh, decision you know, in this hour, uh, because, you know, it has implications for what the, the economic experts will do um, in their work, you know, and so I just want to encourage us to, to kind of be vocal, you know, about where we stand, what we believe um, our views will be, so that way we can actually come, you know, with, you know, the, uh, a very precise scope of work for the experts to, you know, help us with the accounting uh, that needs to happen. Uh, you know, for my part, you know, I will say very clearly that, you know, especially, you know, given the fact that we've heard from, from Secretary of State, um, Dr. Shirley Weber, you know, and even my own views of, of thinking about, well, what are the consequences uh, for reparations on the very composition of black identification? Uh, my understanding from my own work, my own research, is that reparations should explicitly open up the question about what it means to constitute the identification and the belonging to what we can think of as the black community. And so, you know, to, 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 to put the, the point out there, you know, I am, I am firmly, you know, in, in agreement with this notion that we have to start with the, the claims of what have been identified as Americans who are descended of those enslaved in the United States. The idea here is that we are identifying a kind of central group, right, that has been integral to the development of the United States, who have remained the referent for the abuse suffered by black people at whichever point they enter into, um, you know, the American national frame. And so when we're talking about reparations, we have to start and, and, and decisively recognize the claims of this group. Um, this is where I think the the kind of task that we have, you know, been granted uh, brings us. And, and, and that's, I think, you know, where we have to start a deliberation. Thank, thank you for that, Member Grills. I mean, sorry, uh, Member Lewis. Uh -huh. 
Any other comments? I guess to provide um, you know additional context for those who might be new to the conversation, um, right? So we've had conversations around uh, the community of eligibility for some months now, but just this past January, uh, Secretary Weber, um, who was the lead author of A3121, uh, gave a presentation or testimony to the task force, clarifying her intent as to who she deemed to be a part of the community of eligibility. And um, from my understanding, based on what she um, relayed to the task force, um, that special consideration language uh, would be um, deemed that, you know, the, the community that is regarded to have special consideration are Black Americans or African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. And then the more broader um, community of eligibility uh, would be to Black Americans who can trace their lineage to free people of color in this in, in the United States during the period of enslavement. And to I think Ms. Ayatoro's point yesterday, right? Um, you know, there were some instances of Africans living in this in this country who were um, never enslaved. And then there were also, you know, free people of color in the sense that they were once enslaved or they were descendants of enslaved people themselves. Um, they just were emancipated before um, the majority of Black Americans by virtue of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865. And so, again, in summary, what, what I gleaned from um, Secretary Weber, again, opening the session to all task force members, is that the community of eligibility would be to African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States, where they can trace their lineage to an enslaved ancestor in the United States, and to Black Americans who can trace their ancestry to a free people of color, uh, Black people in this country who were living during the, the period of an enslavement, but still were, were facing anti-Black discrimination, still had to navigate a very precarious anti-Black world, and in some instances um, could be um, um, brought back into slavery violently, like Robert Perkins, for example, is someone that we learned about um, at our first hearing in September, through the testimony of um, Professor Stacy Smith. So I just wanted to provide that context um, for, for, for the audience as well. Um, I would also like to take the time to recognize any other task force members um, to offer their reflections on, again, the conversations that we've had um, about this issue. I'm Chair. I'm chair. Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. And members of the task force. For all that we've heard from the public that has comment, whom we should listen to based on the logic the facts, and the legality. And finally, the initiator, the birther, the mother of this measure made it very clear what she intended. And I would like to appeal to the body So we won't get confused that the lineage-based presentation that she made will be adopted by this August body. Senator Bradford is raising his hand. Yeah, I, sorry, I, I thought I was unmuted. <laughs> Senator Bradford, you are recognized. Uh, thank you. And I really need to just say ditto to what Dr. Brown stated as one of two members uh, on this task force who actually voted for the measure. I think 
Dr. Shirley Weber, uh, now Secretary of State Shirley Weber, was very intentional about who she felt reparations should be for and who they should address. Now, we all have heard from, I mean, amazing testimony over the last three months of the impact of slavery uh, and the impact on African Americans who weren't directly enslaved or uh, have lineage to slavery because the remnants of slavery is still impacting African Americans in this country today. But as it relates to AB 3121 and how we're trying to shape uh, who's entitled and what reparations looks like, I think Dr. Weber spelled it out. I think the bill clearly speaks to who it was intended for. And I think we would be um, well served if we just followed the path that Dr. Weber has uh, created and uh, stated through this legislation. So that's where I am on this. Chair, you're, you're muted still. Member Jones, saw your head is hand up, Madam Chair. And so did Dr. Grells, if you can hear me. Thank you. You're muted, Madam Chair. You're still muted. Hear me now? Yes. No? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to... My microphone was off mute. That's so strange. Go ahead, Member John Sawyer. Um, this this particular issue is, is not only interesting to me, but very, very difficult. Um, uh, especially when, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, if you look at an African American whose lineage may be from Kenya and his mother may be white, um, but has experienced racism recently that goes all the way back to slavery, that their vestiges of slavery have continued on till now. And if it wasn't for affirmative action and some of the policies that were put in place to remove some of those barriers, um, a person like a Barack Obama would not be president of the United States. And in in essence, we're saying people like that who experiencing racism now, and you can't tell me Barack Obama didn't experience racism, could not be part of reparations or could not be part of this. Um, my discussions directly with Dr. Weber is you're absolutely right. She wanted special consideration or, um, as we say in in, in legislative work, it's weighted toward people who ancestry can be linked directly um, to people who were enslaved. Um, and then, as was stated by the chair and others, she believed then we start looking at others who have been adversely impacted because at the end of the day, the, the and I, I think Senator Bradford will agree with me, we wanted as a legislature, especially those that voted for this, we want to start as part of this reparations also to stop, just stop or put a, a, a breaker point in the barriers that have kept our people from matriculating uh, and being able to be successful. Um, uh, I, I don't believe a check is the ultimate solution. If the vestiges of redlining, not allowing us to get into the universities we wanted, not allowing us to get the jobs we want, not allowing us to be able to become head coaches in the NFL, if all of that is still going on, you could give every black person in this state a million bucks, but it doesn't guarantee that it will uplift us for centuries on. and that discussion I had with Dr. Weber was that was she, a key piece of this. Uh, we're talking about who's getting the money when we should be talking about how we're going to take care of our people 
from this day forward and how we're going to reverse all the harm that we, that should be the central question um uh, we're, we're we're spending the money before we got it and we really need to just focus on what policy procedures and things we can also do to make sure that happened i mentioned to yesterday to mr shermaninsky about you know the, in, in in some ways this is a lawsuit to address damages to our people um damages that have been going on for centuries and in a lawsuit it's basically you know it's, it's either monetary it's it's either acknowledging the harm which i think is in that thousand page paper i don't know if you've read it yet but that we're we're outlining i think we've proven the point and we want the state of california to not only acknowledge it but to to make sure that they they talk about this never happening again in california and then how do we stop it from happening you remove it like i said yesterday if if you contaminate uh uh the water with groundwater you just don't leave it there yes you got the check but if you leave the groundwater contaminated then people are still dying and people still being harmed. We're not talking about removing the contaminated water. We're not talking about community, which in, the, in our case is racism, is what they've done to our people, what they're continuing to do to our people in this society. We need to focus in on that in addition to making sure that people who look like us, because I've, I've said this a million times, um, if you're half white, and you're at a Klan meeting and they're going to hang somebody, they don't hang half of your white students. They hang the whole black person. At the end of the day, people who are prejudiced against us are prejudiced against all of us. And the vestiges of Willie Lynch, if you read the Willie Lynch letters on how to, how to control a Negro, he talks about keeping us separate by fighting amongst one another. And when I hear individuals, just, and I hear the passion, and when I say I hear the passion, is because they are speaking for our ancestors. When you hear that pain and everybody that's called here about descending the slaves, they're channeling all of our ancestors who have been who have been harmed and hurt um, over centuries that hadn't had opportunity to speak, and in a, in a kind of a metaphysical way, they are speaking for them, and that's the pain that you hear. And that's why they're so passionate about it. And that's why we need to honor that, that passion. Uh, I know you guys hear me talk about my uncle, who's one of the Little Rock Nine. He was on Oprah Winfrey show. And they interviewed every last one of them. And they didn't show my uncle's interview. Because when Oprah went from each one asked, do you forgive your tormentor? My uncle was the only one that said hell no on national TV, and he didn't show it. So I, I, I get, I get the pain that he experienced in 1957, that it, that trauma that he experienced has never gone away, and that and, and 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 it's hurtful. And I can hear it not only amongst my colleagues on this on this esteemed commission, but what I would implore us to do is one as we move forward let's be not only intentional but really talk about implementation and how we're going to do better for our people so even with the lineage which i think we should investigate and move forward how can we do it how much will it cost it how accurate should it be and if you talk to the uh, native americans even they have problems whether you're one percent native american five percent ten percent are, are you know are you are we going to get to that specificity um but we need to we need to have that also that discussion about when people make claims how are they going to be able um to be able to fully get their reparations from that if we're talking about the monetary thing and i think we definitely should to figure it out but we also need we just don't need to do it because that's what we do as elected officials. We make laws, and sometimes we don't give enough resources. Sometimes we don't give enough money, and sometimes we just come up with stupid ideas. But we forced it on the government to do it. 
we're going to foist this on who to find out doing the genealogy. I mean, that needs to be part of our our uh, our discussion. Or as we turn this over to the legislature, we need to also give them direction on how to to, to discuss or how to find lineage, uh, lineage. And if we have to put money toward that, what would that cost too? So that is not that is not an inexpensive endeavor um, because the records aren't aren't that good. And so that, it, that's part of one of these pieces that we need to do and, and it, is just figure that out and get some experts to help us with that. Because I think it's extremely important um, as we move forward with uh, who's going to get what in descendant of slaves. And then part two of it, just trying to get a sense of if you are harmed, and I think Sherman Inski is was, was saying in these lawsuits, and again, I'm practicing law without a license, it's about harm and the extent of that harm um, that this country, the state has put on black people. We, we, we need to quantify that in some substantive way so that we can remove that harm. And if we have to provide financial assistance to get over that harm, let's do that. But we need to, we need to figure out what, what that is and, and make it real and not just kind of generally, it should be whatever. And so I, I, I would implore that we do dive even deeper than what we have, that we maybe we all just kind of agree there should be reparations, um, but we need to dive deeper to figure out um, how how we're going to do that based on harm, on harm to uh, an, an African an African American or an African or whatever. Because again, people that look like us that are in California, they're suffering just as much right now as people um, who with descendants of slaves. Um, so uh, that's kind of, I know it's probably more than I've ever talked before, but that's uh, kind of my two cents. Member Reggie John Sawyer, Member Grills, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, this is a very serious and difficult discussion. Um, and the first thing that came to mind for me um, and thinking about what I wanted to share was that it was a, a, a variation on Audre Lorde's quote. We are trying to dismantle the master's structures of white supremacy using the master's tools of divide and conquer based on arbitrary points of drop off to shores in the United States versus parts of the Caribbean or Central or South America or being left behind to suffer under colonial rule. Um, it, it's that separation of the house Negro and the field Negro. And none of those master's tools serve us well. Um, in fact, our ancestors who were enslaved here in the United States held onto their value systems and fought against that. Frederick Douglass said it himself in his autobiography, he talked about how critically important it was for those enslaved on those plantations to maintain a robust sense of community, to not let their identity as people of African ancestry be shaped and defined by the very people that were oppressing them and denying them their humanity. And so as their offspring, as one of the offsprings of a, of a, an enslaved of enslaved Africans in this country, I want to hold on to that part of my ancestors' struggle and resilience and understanding about how critical it is to maintain our humanity and our sense of connection to each other. So, given that, when I think about this this question or this discussion, I am 100% opposed to thinking about this as a final vote on the matter of el community of eligibility. And I say that I'm against it because we have not finished doing our work to know the implications and the cost of doing that. So what do I mean by this? 
Someone said um, in public comment this morning, don't go against public will as they advocated for um, direct lineage, a, a lineage position. I actually agree with them. We should not go against public will. But we don't have all the public will information yet. I appreciate all of the information that, and, and that has been shared in the public comments since the beginning of our task force meetings. However, that is not a representation of the diverse set of perspectives and opinions, which is why we are having these listening sessions. So how do we say that the voices of the community, not the voice of two or three or four organized groups who've done a very good job, hats off to them, of making their perspectives and their, their um, um, will known, but that is not the representation of the entire community. And so how do we tell the community that your, your input is valued and important, but then before they can even get to it, we say, but we're gonna decide without you what the community of eligibility should be. Um, and so I think that's a slap in the face to our listening session um, to assume that what we've heard so far in public comment is representative. Secondly, I get I, I'm 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 struggling with this notion about lineage determination, and I yes I have heard people say repeatedly how easy this is, but I have yet to hear experts in genealogy tell us how easy or difficult this is. I think that that is one of the things that we should bring to the table as a task force, the expertise of people who can tell us because that is their professional expertise, how easy or difficult is this going to be if we go by lineage? And what, how will we possibly be setting people up to be left out of reparations because they cannot establish that lineage? And how are we setting ourselves up to even more nuanced complications as we look at this lineage thing? We're going to reduce ourselves yet again to one of the master's tools. You know, that what something in, akin to the one drop rule where, okay, your mother is a, a direct descendant and your father is um, a Caribbean immigrant. So you got the one drop rule through your mother, or, you know, how's that going to work? Um, and then there's this notion about um, you've got you know, uh, black immigrants, whether they came during the early 1900s or they came in 2000, um, you know, are, are going to, some are, should be excluded. Even though AB 3121 says that we should be looking at the harms done from the legacy of enslavement, not just the period of enslavement. And so if that be the case, what is it that these African and Caribbean immigrants are going to take away from the direct descendants. I'm not understanding that. It's like, are people assuming that there's this finite pot of money and that if, 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 if there's a hundred dollars in the pot of money, then that has to be divided, that can only be divided among the descendants because if we decide, if it's divided about all, among all who are harmed, everybody's gonna get a smaller amount. We haven't had that conversation yet, but there's an awful lot of concern about detracting from descendants if we embrace immigrants, African descended immigrants. So I'd love to hear more about that because, you know, I actually went and I went down the rabbit hole and started looking at what numbers of people are we talking about in terms of black immigrants? It's not that large. It really is not that large. And then I scratch my head, you know, with all due respect to Secretary Weber, I scratch my head when I ask the question, so how does one interpret the special consideration, right? Why was that clause in there? And the, the response back was, you know, to address the free blacks. Well, how many people are we talking about? Super minuscule. 
And why would the, in a state legislation, we need to make a statement to that effect for such a minuscule number of folks? Um, so, so this whole notion about who, how many people are we talking about and how does that somehow detract from the direct descendants, I haven't heard enough information about. And then the other thing is, um, what happens to those who can't establish their lineage? I keep coming back to that because um, truth be told, the master's tools have made it very difficult to establish lineage. The records are not that great, right? Doing a DNA test is not going to answer the question. Um, and um, this, this idea that, um, okay, we'll set up some kind of process where some entity can now go around figuring out everybody's lineage, um, that just feels like it's like recycling money right back to the master's coffers. Right? How's that serving us? Um, and and then I can stop it. Well, no, let me add one more piece because folks love to quote Dean Chemerinsky. So I did have a question um, for him that um, DOJ passed on for me. The question was uh, the following. You discussed in your testimony that having a race neutral approach is important under current ju judicial pre precedents and suggested that a lineage focused approach would accomplish that. Do you believe that a race neutral approach that takes into account the harms done, such as redlining, lynching, segregation, medical testing, and other harms done specifically to blacks in the post-slavery era, but not tied specifically to proof of lineage, connect with an enslaved person um, would also accomplish this. Further, is there any legal precedent that could address the fact that many potentially eligible people would be unable to establish such lineage due to systems that dehumanized and disconnected Blacks from their history and culture including child welfare removal, adoption, abandonment, and de facto compelled migration. How could this task force account for lineage gaps in defining the community of eligibility, or do you believe that doing so would undercut the likelihood that such a program would survive scrutiny? Dean Chemerinsky was gracious enough to provide a reply last night. It was very short, sweet, and to the point. His response was, I think this is a great question. I think it points to the problems with reparations being lineage based. But the question I was addressing was, what is most likely to be upheld by the courts? Reminder, master's tools. So the courts, which are highly racially biased at this point in time, and they have been throughout history, you just gotta look at some of their rulings. Um, he says that my conclusion was that lineage-based reparations are much more likely to be upheld while race-based reparations are much more likely to be struck down. So I recognize the limitations of lineage-based reparations. In other words, he is saying it is not the foolproof. It is not the, the, the godsend. It is not the magic bullet. And it's going to come with serious consequences. And have we weighed those consequences? So he says, I recognize the limitations of lineage-based reparations, but simply say that if you want something that has a greater likelihood of being upheld, and I'm adding in a racist court, uh, it is better not to define this in terms of race. So I don't think that we have the definitive answer. I think that Dean Chemerinsky himself is acknowledging those limitations. And I feel that in, in terms of giving some kind of direction to the economists, how come, I, I, you know, this black white thinking, it's all or none thinking is troubling for me. And so my question is, how do I get out of that box and say, can we in fact ask the economists to do two scenarios? And let's compare them, right? They can just change, I think it would be they would change the denominator 
in the equation and say, what would the reparations, you know, um, uh, monies look like with just direct descendants using a lineage base? And what would it look like if we didn't limit it to lineage base, but we limited it to, I mean, we anchored it around arms, right? So, and that we do our work and bring in some folks that can help us understand the consequences of the lineage issue. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. Um, I appreciate our colleague of Grills's particularity in raising the questions that she raised. Number two, each of us brings to this task a wealth of experience. However, I'm assuming that the powers that be would not have sought us out if they had not viewed us as being practitioners, social engineers, historians, and persons who've been a part of a representative government because of our passion and commitment. We are task force. We brought something to this task force. And we should respect each other's experience for after all, Tennyson did say, I'm a part of all that I have met. And each of us has had different meaning, meetings. Speaking personally, since the age of 14, in Jackson, Mississippi, I have been a world citizen. My first experience in a world's affairs camp was in 1958, Circle Pines, Michigan. And I also up at Cornell University, Camp Danby, outside of, outside of Cornell, Douglas College campus. I've been to Africa 25 times, all over east, south, north, and west to Brazil, to Russia, to India. And I thank God that out of these 81 years, I've stayed on the case and been passionate about the liberation of all peoples. However, there's such a thing as a variety of experiences. And some of us are just had a harder, more harsh experience with this thing of racism, oppression, and enslavement. When you go to a hospital, some people, in the general war, others are in the intensive care unit, and they receive the treatment that's user-friendly and appropriate to bring the state of wellness. Next, I would say, I don't use any master's tools in my thinking. But that great schoolmaster, Dr. Benjamin Liza Mays, said so eloquently to Dr. King and to me as a student, if you can't think for yourself, someone else will do your thinking for you. And whoever does your thinking for you will be your master and you their slave. And I have thought for myself. I have listened for myself. And I don't use no master's tool. I know about Willie Lynch. Like I mentioned last Sunday in my sermon. Right here at Third Baptist. I'm familiar with Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey 
And also I know something about Reverend Junus Camp Austin, who was the father of Pan-Africanism way back in the 1950. The man who, when you see Marcus Garvey in that convertible with his plumish hat on, sitting right next to him, who was that man? J.C. Austin, that Baptist preacher, who back in the 1920s was a part of the Garvey movement. I'm not citing all this history to be braggadocious. What I'm saying is, I, I, I think I have a pretty good vantage point of knowing what's right and what's doable in a practical democratic society. And if we are talking about trying to do something of making strides toward, as Dr. King used the word, strides toward freedom, you have to begin somewhere. And with the Asian community, we all know that their reparations was about being paid for what was specifically done to them at a time and period in history. Specific, specificity. When you look at the Jewish community, reparations have meant what was done to them at specific points in history. The GI Bill was about a specific situation to do something for those brave soldiers fought for this country. So I, I, I hope that we will not get bogged down as scholars, as social engineers, practitioners, community servants, and understand that nothing in this world is going to be perfect. There ain't no utopia. Heaven ain't on this earth yet. Hell is down here. And that, if you let me quote that prophet from Nazareth, that, that liberator, even when he prayed that prayer, he said, Lord, I pray not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And what we need to do is to do something that's going to give some modicum of protection for black folks who were enslaved by this evil system. That Atlantic slave trade. That our ancestors worked sun up to sundown here in these United States of America in Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, Texas. That's the scene of the crime. That's where it all happened. That's what we are talking about, a system, enslavement. And everybody was not enslaved. The same. There were grades of it, yes. They can be quantified, yes. But when we look at, look at an overall systemic system, we know what we're talking about. That codified, organized, unified system where our ancestors were sold on chop, slave chop blocks, slave blocks in the United States of America, in Savannah, Natchez, Mississippi, Charleston, South Carolina. That's the scene of the crime. And I hope that we would look through clear eyes where the crime happened and not stop there. I believe in progressive revelation. We shouldn't become satisfied and stop. But the next step would be for us to move to other areas. There's one room that's never filled. The old preacher said, and that's a room for improvement. So I, I plead with us to not go around as if we don't know what has happened to black folks and if we don't know what the crime has been. We know it. And when we go around with these listening sessions, that is a matter greatly 
friends, of courtesy. For the things that you will hear and that I will hear will be nothing that was not said a hundred years ago. Don't be any different. Man is the same. Man is the woman. They're all the same. Historically. The tendency to exclude others or to include others. To have all of the stuff as a greedy person for self or to share and be altruistic. That's universal. The world over. Idolizing one group at the expense of the other. The world over. So we're not going to learn anything in a different of going through this process. We will just hear again about the age old sins, foibles, and evils of human beings who need to get it right. So I hope, I pray that we will come to common ground and first have a common understanding of what we're shooting for. And when we know what we're shooting for, even if we don't read it, at least we will know where we are trying to aim to go. And we can spend all of this time, I use my pet word again, a paralysis of analysis, and we won't get anywhere. And I think we have heard sufficiently from reasonable amount of expert opinion about the legality of any reparations that we would get and it came down on saying the lineage is a beginning point, not a stopping point, not the end of the journey, but a major place to begin. Thank you for indulging me, but let's do something and get on with what's going to be the hard thing, and that is to get the body politic to support it, whatever we come up with. And we will have done that real hard work. That's 80% of this job. Yeah. Dealing with that assembly, dealing with the governor's office, and make sure that we have the troops out there. Willie Brown said, if you're going to be successful as a practical politician, and politics is involved, what is the art of the possible? You better know how to count. And we got, got to know how to count. Uh, else we will go Madam Chair, uh, Ma uh, Member Montgomery Steps hand is raised. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. Excuse that interruption. Uh, Member Montgomery Step, you're recognized. And I also want to be mindful of the time. Um, we're running into um, the end of the, the part of the agenda. So, We'll take a, a comment from Member Montgomery. Depp. I also have some words, and um, yeah, we'll figure out what, oh. what we'll do next. Okay, You're thank right. you, Chair Watt. Uh, I also didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I just wanted to get a few thoughts here, I guess, on the record. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, I, I, I do think that we have a framework from the language in the bill that we have to work with, and I think. Um, the phrase special consideration is part of that framework, but also throughout the bill, it does, uh, when it references um, uh, discriminatory practices that have occurred after um, slavery, it, it does go back to the enslaved and their descendants. It, it does say that in the bill. Um, and so, I also think that the listening sessions will be important to get a full, um, well, to, to hear more opinions, but we do still have a framework that is the bill um, that we are sort of working under the power of. Um, so that's why I do think that, well, that and other reasons is why I think that, that we should um, base, a, base this off of, um, the lineage um, discussion. I also, I have issues with the lineage discussion and, and that approach because I don't know how easy it will get be for people to prove that and what process we will take them through for that, including myself. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, that that is something that I that concerns me as a consequence of going that route. 
Um, I also don't, whenever I hear race neutral, I cringe because just even my experience at the local level, any race neutral program um, effectively um, excludes black folks. Um, I, I have seen that. And so it, it does, I do have, I want to put those concerns on the record from a practical perspective, but from the framework that we're working with right now and what we have been tasked to do, um, I think it is to deal with the direct harm that occurred um, to um, to the enslaved and their descendants. I, I think there are many other tracks and many other things that we have to consider when it comes to eliminating discriminatory practices in California and nationwide. Um, I just don't know that we have the framework to do that with what we've been tasked to do um, with this particular bill. Uh, we heard from the author of the bill. Um, and, and so I will leave my comments at that based on, on the time. Um, but we do need to we do need to have a discussion also about the consequences of, of whatever decision we make and and how much responsibility we're going to take as a task force for those for those consequences. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're speaking. Yeah, you're and, muted. Um, you're muted. Okay, no, there's something wrong with the um, image, but can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to just provide some comments to give some clarity as to where I stand and, and to also make some brief comments on what's been discussed already. Um, and so to be transparent, I am in favor of a lineage standard and, and there's a couple of reasons why. For instance, we heard a personal and expert testimony from Lawrence Lucas, who um, is one of the leaders in the Black Farmers Movement. And you know, he displayed this very touching video about the history of Black farmers and the dispossession of their land. And we know that you know, their plight is in the news right now because you know, $5 billion would have gone to these Black farmers who have lost over 90% of their land over the past century you know, due to systemic racial discrimination and, and predatory um, um, acts from the government. Um, but because this, the, the bill that would have given that, them that land was race-based, um, you know, we, you had people suing them. And so now there's an injunction and that money in, in, is in limbo. And those people, those black farmers have nothing right and we know who those black farmers are right they're not just black right they carry with them a, a certain history and a certain lineage they're the descendants of slaves like martin luther king jr said they're descendants of sharecroppers they know the land by virtue of them being the descendants of the enslaved and despite that agricultural knowledge that was passed on to them as being descendants of enslaved people they're being refused aid um and I think that that is extremely problematic. And it's and it's it's telling about the society that we live in, particularly that you know if the language was crafted in a certain way, those five billion dollars would have gone to Lawrence Lucas and all those black farmers by now. Um, another point that I wanted to raise is that the this conversation has made me think more deeply about the role of genealogy in 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 reparations efforts for Black Americans. And I kind of reject the notion that, you know, consulting ge uh, genealogy or DNA companies, company, companies would just recycle dollars to, to, to white hands. I don't know if that was the language per se, but, you know, we do know that there are Black American and African American owned DNA companies and gene genealogical companies. And so there could be a partnership just being imaginative that could you know, also be helpful for a community that's eligible, um, where you know, these Black-owned African-American or de uh, genealogy, genealogist companies or DNA companies um, working with whatever, uh, whatever system that we propose to help people find their family members um, through DNA, as you can find the relatives through DNA um, um, for those, for people who might, you know, be in child welfare instances, 
Or, you know, African-American genealogists, and I think Deidre Farmer-Pellman mentioned that yesterday in her testimony, when she said like, well, it, that was a surprise to me that this, this stuff is hard work. There, it really isn't as hard as people make it out to be. Um, the other point that I wanted to raise um, is the idea of CARICOM, right? We know that CARICOM um, is a collection of Caribbean nation states, and they are doing the hard and, and, and formidable work of trying to get reparations from their former colonial masters. And as a Black American, 